iOS 17 is here bringing with it a ton of cool new tricks. But there's one new feature coming that perhaps you didn't know about yet. It's one that Apple neglected to mention at all in its WWDC keynote, and one that potentially bulldozes a hole right through that walled garden. Sometime during the lifespan of iOS 17, sideloading and third-party app stores will come to the iPhone. Apple doesn't want to do this, but if it wants to keep selling iPhones, it's going to have to. It's a big, huge deal that's been a long time coming, with a fascinating backstory involving greed, billionaire backbiting, and some of the biggest apps around. I'm Alex Dobie, this is XDA TV, let's dive in. So how did we get here? Well, Apple has always locked down what you can and can't do with your iPhone. The very first iPhone didn't even have an app store. And when that app store arrived, it came with strict requirements around content and privacy. Apple had to review every single app manually, and nothing got onto the iPhone officially without the guys in Cupertino signing off on it. It was restrictive, sure, but in terms of ensuring tight security and a squeaky clean reputation for the iPhone, this was mostly a good thing. Malware on iOS was rare, and in the early days it had a distinct security advantage over Android. Which was why it was such a huge deal when early iOS versions were jailbroken, cracking open their security and allowing Cydia and other third-party app stores to be loaded, making a mockery of Apple's restrictions. I still remember playing a super janky version of Quake on my iPod Touch back in the day, thanks to Cydia, and being amazed how this tiny handheld could run something that a decade or so earlier required a full power-hungry desktop PC. The App Store was big business, and if you wanted to sell apps or content on the iPhone, Apple demanded a 30% revenue cut. Don't want to pay? Tough. The App Store is the only game in town. And to more than a few people, that sounded a little bit like a monopoly. The easy counterexample to point to was Android, which was much more akin to a personal computer when it came to installing apps. After clicking past some security warnings, you could just download and install Android apps from wherever, and even add additional app stores if you wanted to. Though the Android market was the default, you could easily get your apps from other places too. Whether the iPhone App Store situation was truly a monopoly was a contentious issue. Supporters of Apple viewed it as a platform charge needed to support the curation of the App Store and keep the lights on at Apple's data centers. Meanwhile, opponents pointed to Apple's deliberate decision to block competing App Stores on iOS in contrast to the Mac, where there were no such restrictions. This controversy has been bubbling for as long as the App Store has been a thing. But it wasn't until the early 2020s that it really began to blow up, starting with a veteran developer and one of the biggest games in the world. Epic Games was already a huge name in gaming by the time it entered the mobile space. It's led by this guy, CEO Tim Sweeney, whose vision and a big programmer brain was central to Epic's success. Epic's big break into mobile gaming was Infinity Blade, built for iOS to show off the power of the new iPhone 4 in 2010. It quickly became Epic's most profitable title yet, while also making Apple a pretty penny in the process. In 2011, Tim Sweeney hailed the game's success as proof that there was a market for glitzy AAA games on mobile. For a time, Epic was an App Store darling, but this relationship didn't last. Why? Well, it all started to unravel in 2017, when it launched a little game called Fortnite. Fortnite was a slow burn at first, but eventually pivoted towards battle royale gameplay and promptly engulfed the competition. By 2021, the free-to-play title was earning Epic Games $5.8 billion in yearly revenue, contributing to a total equity valuation of more than $28 billion for Epic around the start of the current decade. That's compared to a mere $825 million back in the Infinity Blade days. That's not Apple money, but it's also not chump change. Yet Epic, like almost every other developer who operated on the iOS App Store, remained subject to that 30% cut of every transaction made on Apple's platform. According to numbers given by Apple in 2020, Epic earned $700 million in revenue from the App Store during the two years Fortnite was available there. So Apple's 30% cut amounted to an extra $150 million a year not going into Epic's coffers. Tim Sweeney wasn't happy about this, and he made no secret of it. As Fortnite grew in popularity, he made his displeasure at the Apple tax very clear in interviews with various gaming and entertainment publications. Against that backdrop, Epic attempted to negotiate a new agreement with Apple that would let it keep more of its iOS V-Bucks. Apple, unsurprisingly, refused. Epic was a huge player in gaming, but it ultimately had little leverage with the most valuable company the world had ever known. 
And so in August 2020, Epic sprung a trap designed to basically poke the bear and simultaneously bring the vast Fortnite player base in on its side in the ensuing battle. It covertly pushed a hotfix update to both the iOS and Android versions of Fortnite with a new payment system that bypassed Apple and Google entirely. The inevitable result? Fortnite was swiftly booted off both app stores. Epic knew exactly what it was doing here and to prepare a free Fortnite campaign complete with splashy promotional video styled after Apple's famous 1984 Macintosh ad. This all went online along with press releases in the aftermath of the aforementioned booting. Incidentally, let's just take a sec to appreciate the sheer intergenerational weirdness of using this ad from the dying days of 1983 to rally a user base who, according to the stats at the time, were mostly born in the late 90s and early 2000s. Either way, the idea that Fortnite was being held hostage here didn't really stand up to a whole lot of scrutiny. Epic knew what would happen when it deliberately cut Apple out of its share of those sweet, sweet V-Bucks. This was Epic's decision, and it could have easily freed Fortnite itself if it just abided by the agreement it signed with Apple. It also seemed a little disingenuous to me for this to be framed around freeing Fortnite at all. Instead, it seemed nakedly obvious that this fight was about the only thing that really mattered to a multi-billion dollar company like Epic, or a multi-trillion dollar company like Apple. Money. As for Google, it was also a subject of Epic's ire, but it only really plays a walk-on role in our story here. The impact of Fortnite being pulled from the Play Store wasn't anywhere near as serious for Android players, because unlike iPhone owners, they could simply sideload the game themselves. No need to sell a kidney and pick up a second-hand iPhone preloaded with an old version of Fortnite. Anyway, as you might have expected in the absence of anyone budging, what resulted was a good old-fashioned lawsuit. Epic sued both Apple and Google, arguing, among other things, that Apple's refusal to allow third-party app stores on iOS constituted a monopoly. Epic now wanted the iPhone to open up and allow third-party app stores and payment processors for all developers. The Epic vs Apple legal slap fight resulted in a fascinating trove of emails being unearthed, links in the description to a great roundup on The Verge, but otherwise reached a rather unsatisfying conclusion in late 2021. Judge Yvonne Gonzalez Rogers ruled mainly in Apple's favour, concluding Apple wasn't a monopoly, but also noting concern at the lack of competition in mobile gaming. For all Epic's fire and fury, it basically failed in its attempt to free Fortnite from Apple's 30% revenue demands. It was a lose-lose-lose situation. Apple and its customers lost Fortnite, Epic lost the App Store, even choosing to yank Infinity Blade from the store in the aftermath, and we were no closer to third-party app stores or sideloading being allowed on iOS. But that's not the end of our story, because from across the Atlantic, politicians had been watching. In 2022, the European Union introduced the Digital Markets Act, a wide-ranging piece of legislation potentially affecting everything from chat apps to search engines and, of course, mobile operating systems. What we're most interested in, though, is the part about big platform holders, or gatekeepers as the EU calls them. When this law kicks in in March 2024, gatekeepers like Apple will have to facilitate alternative ways to get apps on their customers' phones. In Europe, and perhaps also further afield, by law the App Store will no longer be the only game in town. Exactly how this will work isn't totally clear. Many Apple Watchers were expecting to see some clues at WWDC, the big annual developer conference, but Apple's remained completely silent. Perhaps not surprising, WWDC is Apple's big splashy event, and it wants reporters talking about the new MacBooks and Vision Pro headset, not about how it's being forced by the EU to do something it would really rather not be doing. Apple's company line, for what it's worth, has always been that it abides by the law in all countries where it operates. Make of that what you will. We still don't know if sideloading and or third-party app stores will be coming to just European iPhones, or whether Apple will find it's too difficult to just limit this feature to one region and instead open things up globally. Nor do we know who might jump on this opportunity to offer their own iOS store. Epic Games is a likely candidate, but could we also see a Google or Amazon app store on the iPhone? It's not outside the realms of possibility. Either way, by the spring of 2024, if it wants to continue selling phones in Europe, Apple will have some kind of solution in iOS 17 or 17 point whatever to allow people to get their apps from other places. If you know Apple, you might expect them to do this in the most low-key, user-hostile way possible. I mean, just look at how Apple accommodates right-to-repair laws in the US. It'll happily sell or loan you the components to repair your iPhone yourself, but if you're just a regular person, you don't save any money doing it this way versus just taking it to the Apple Store. One distinct possibility is that European iPhones do get sideloading and third-party app store support, 
but it's enabled in a way that's too much hassle for most people to bother with or accompanied by scary security warnings designed to send most people running back to the safety of the walled garden. Apple has argued in the past that it can't open up the iPhone like this without sacrificing your security and privacy. And look, it's not entirely wrong about that. One single point of entry for all apps, policed by a single all-seeing, all-knowing authority, is more secure. The iPhone is compared to a walled garden for a reason after all, but in the digital world, as in the real world, there is a balance between security and liberty. Android is a great example of how you can support sideloading and more varied app stores while still retaining a reasonable level of security. Google Play Protect runs on every Google certified Android phone and can zap bad apps before they have a chance to do anything malicious regardless of where they came from. And this can be updated in the background automatically without requiring any kind of firmware update. Apple could develop something similar and still be an effective gatekeeper in terms of security and privacy, and it's very likely something like this is in the works behind the scenes ahead of that March 2024 deadline. Still, there remain many unanswered questions. Will this newfound app freedom be limited to just European iPhones? Just how easy will it be to load third-party app stores onto your iPhone once it is supported? Will there be any unforeseen security consequences? Or will it lead to a new golden age for a more open iPhone and a happier Tim Sweeney with extra millions in his pockets from sales on the new Epic Games iOS store? A more open iOS is coming very soon for at least some of us. And it'll be fascinating to see what form that takes, even if Apple's not talking about it publicly just yet. In closing, one thing that's worth remembering when corporations like Epic, Apple, or Google come to fisticuffs is that none of them are your friend. When big beasts like today's cast of characters do battle and try to rally fans to their cause, it's inevitably about the money, and any alternate narratives are almost always PR spin. Apple wants to keep the iPhone locked down to make more money. Epic wants to open it up to make more money. And you know, Google's worth a trillion and a half as well, I'm sure it likes money too. Be a fan of an exceptional individual if you like, or an amazing product if you must. But there are better things in the world to infuse over than a billion or trillion dollar entity that only exists to become worth additional billions. That's it for now. If you like this video, be sure to check out our deep dive on whether Android security is still a toxic hell stew after more than a decade. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.